Good morning and welcome. Uh, my name is Les Glinsky. I'm the, the deacon of benevolence, deacon for benevolence here at uh, Faith EPC. Uh, thanks for joining us this morning. Um, just to bring you your attention, there, there are white cards in the back of the chair in front of you. Uh, whether you're a visitor or a member, just go ahead and please fill those out so we have a record of your attendance here this morning, along with um, these cards that they look like a bulletin, but they don't have today's date on them. They say about us. It's just got more information about the church, and there are also in there little um, envelopes for giving if you'd like to use those. Um, the mission of the month for December is helping in his name food pantry. You can see the the needs they have there on the, the back section of the of the worship guide. Um, tonight is carols and cake. The cake is provided. The carols are provided. We just need you to bring your voice. Um, it starts at 6:30. Uh, also, there's a there's a mailbox, a big Tupperware container out on the 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 counter there. It's for Christmas cards. Just stick the cards in the. It's it's organized alphabetically by last name. Um, Yes, also go in there and check and see if you have any. Um, otherwise, I might take them. Um, Christmas Eve candlelight services at 5 p.m. on that Friday. Um, men's Bible study meets every Thursday evening at 7 p.m., but we will not be meeting the 23rd or the 30th. We'll, we'll pick back up again uh, in the new year. Um, please continue to pray for the, the pastor search committee. Um, and they actually have an announcement this morning. They're going to come up and, and give an update. So if y'all could come up real quick. Good morning. I'm Dan Patterson, and you know the rest of these, Wiley Neeson. Laurie Brannon, Mark Watts, and Alan Dennis. And there are two people on our committee who are not here today. That's Jill McClendon and uh, Greg Coniglio. But you know Greg, he sits right here, and Jill may be here later. But we have an exciting announcement to make to you. Uh, after much prayerful consideration and uh, many meetings and interviews with a lot of people, we have chosen the man to call as our next minister and just wanted to give you a heads up about who this person is and what the procedure will be from here. Um, ironically, he comes from Faith Presbyterian Church, Brooksville, Florida, and uh, his name is John Cleveland. Uh, his, he has a wife named Sarah. Uh, they have no children. He's 37 years old. Uh, he's been at that church uh, since 2009. He's been in the role of a youth minister, but since 2012, he's also doing uh, the regular sermons. And we can give you a link. Uh, you can probably just at some point to where you can see some of his sermons. But uh, we met with him personally here um, the Monday before Thanksgiving, Monday night. They happened to be passing through this part of the world, and uh, ironically, just uh, it worked out to where we could meet them. Um, we all voted unanimously. This should be our, the person that we call. And so he will be here, on, and, and the session approved him, we presented to the session this past Wednesday night. Um, he will be here to preach on January the 9th, uh, at which time we will have uh, a congregational terms of call approval by the congregation for him. I mean, that you can hear him, and then we'll have a, a vote for that. If he is approved by the congregation, well then <clears throat> he will need to be, I guess, ordained in our presbytery. Is that right? Is that the word, ordained or approved to enter our presbytery because he is in the Florida presbytery right now. And so that will be the process. We wanted to let you know ahead of time. And if you've got any questions for any of us, please. Jill's standing out there. She's waiting for me to conclude. She, she didn't know that I was going to ask everybody to come forward, but I see her in the back there. But uh, we appreciate all the prayers that you have lifted to our group. We certainly felt them, and uh, we thank God has led us to someone uh, who is going to take 
faith into the next level here. So thanks for any considerations you have. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Yeah, Th thanks for that. Yes, it, the, that's right. The Book of Order does require that we have two weeks' notice for a congregational meeting, and so that's how uh, we have determined that date. So we'll have that. And there's Jill. Hey, Jill, I just gave an announcement. Yeah, everybody look at Jill. <laughs> okay, all right. Well, thanks so much. Brad, if you'll come on. This week we celebrate the joy of Christ's coming to earth. This third candle of Advent reflects the joy that comes through Jesus' arrival and through the salvation he has gifted to us. Psalm 51, 8 through 13 says, Let me hear joy and gladness. Let the bones that you have broken rejoice. Hide your face from my sins and blot out all my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and uphold me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach transgressors your ways, and sinners will return to you. Biblical joy goes far beyond momentary happiness. It is a happiness that cannot be deterred by present circumstances, and this type of joy comes from God alone. Joy. Joy is eager, is eager anticipation about wonderful things to come. The shepherds experienced this as they hurried to Bethlehem after the angel of the Lord appeared to them and brought them the good news that caused great joy <laughs> concerning Jesus' birth. They were there they found Mary, Joseph, and the baby lying in the manger. While we wait for Christ to come again, we don't have to despair. God has given us a joy that no one can take away. No matter what happens in this world, we can experience joy. We can have this joy even in the darkest moments. Joy is essential to the Christian life. We cannot get far without it. And we need it as we, like the shepherds, anticipate the coming of our Savior. Let us pray. Our most gracious Heavenly Father, help us to remember the good news of Jesus' birth and its power to bring us great joy for this season. Our joy isn't dependent on what is going on in our lives or in our world. It doesn't depend on the gifts we give or receive. Our joy comes from you. That joy that flooded the hearts of the shepherds is the joy that still has the power to overwhelm our hearts with rejoicing. Father, you offer that same joy to us now if we know you and recognize Jesus as our Savior and Lord. You gave us a reason to celebrate when you gave us the unspeakable gift of Jesus. He came to dwell among us. Jesus went to Calvary's cross for us. He overcame death and rose from the dead for us. Jesus forgives our sins and gives us eternal life when we believe on him. Our ultimate joy doesn't come from our jobs, our family, our finances, our success, from what we have on earth is the gift that you gave us in Jesus Christ. Our ultimate joy is encompassed in our Savior, King Jesus. Flood our hearts with joy this Advent season as we reflect on the good news of Jesus' birth. In Jesus' precious name we pray. Amen. Good morning. I'm not going to take up a whole lot of time this morning. I don't have a whole lot to say. Um, read two parts of Scripture. 
From Psalm 107, O give thanks to the Lord, for He is good, for His steadfast love endures forever. And from Thessalonians, Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, give thanks in all circumstances, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. I don't know how many of you have been an elder in the church or a deacon as we have now or have been on a committee, a pastor search committee. Um, I was honored and blessed that I have been on both. And there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes that you, that you probably don't see, a lot of meetings that take place and a lot of time away from uh, your family and different things. And so in those two verses about giving thanks, uh, obviously we most give thanks for what God has done for us in, in Christ Jesus, but also for the people that he puts in place to guide and lead his church. Um, and so I am very thankful for the elders and the deacons and the work that they do and for the committee uh, that spent time to meet with and find a new pastor for this church so personally for me to all of you guys thank you very much pray with me please father we are so very blessed um, with this faith presbyterian church the people here the family that they are and we do give thanks for those that are in leadership uh, that you have placed there to lead this church. We thank you for those that make the commitment to do it. This time of year, we're most made aware that we're thankful for the gift that you gave in Christ, that he would humble himself, take on flesh, And we're thankful for life and life everlasting. Not just the life that we have here now, but that that we will have to come when we will be in your presence that Christ made possible through his death and resurrection. As we go into worship today, help us sing with joyful voices and listen to the sermon glean from it what you would have us to hear. All this we ask in Christ's precious name. Amen. <coughs> oh, invitation to worship. If you would please stand. Luke 1, 46. My soul magnifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God my Savior. Our song of praise is hymn number 231, verses 1, 2, 3, and 4, O Come All Ye Faithful. Oh 
In Luke chapter 1, we have the story of Mary visiting Elizabeth, and Mary begins to sing a song about what God is doing. And in this song, she refers all the way back to Abraham, God's promise of what he was to do for his children, God's promise to those to whom he would redeem. So listen to what Mary says in Luke 1, verses starting at verse 50 through 55 in Mary's song. And his mercy is for those who fear him from generation to generation. He has shown strength with his arm. He has scattered the proud in the thoughts of their hearts. He has brought down the mighty from their thrones and exalted those of humble estate. He has filled the hungry with good things, and the rich he has sent away empty. He has helped his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy as he spoke to our fathers, to Abraham, and to his offspring forever. Well, we are that offspring of Abraham in Christ Jesus, and we can look forward to that redemption and that forgiveness of sin forever that we might be in his presence. So let's take this time to go before the Lord and confess our sins and believe that he is faithful, he is just to forgive us for our sins. And now, together, is that offspring of Abraham because of the work of Christ, the blood-bought people, his church. Let us confess our sin together as we pray the prayer together in the worship guide. God of grace, we praise you for sending your Son into the darkness so that we may know his light. Forgive us, for too often we love the darkness more than the light of Jesus. Shed the light of your glory on the cross of your Son so that we may be reminded of your grace towards us. Amen. Let us remember that Jesus looked at his disciples and said, You are the light of the world. Now let us stand and hear the gospel, the assurance of the gospel from Luke chapter 1, verses 68 and 69, saying this together. Blessed be the Lord God of Israel. For he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us. Let's sing a song of praise from the song sheet. God rest you, merry gentlemen.
Amen. You may be seated. This time we're going to continue to worship the Lord through our giving. giving. And we're going to have a song by Wileen Eason during the offertory. So let's worship together with her. Father, we thank you for all that you have done. We thank you particularly at this time of the year for sending your son, the birth of the Lord Jesus. Father, may we take what you have given us and now we return to you. May we take this, Father, and take it into the community to work, to declare that not only did Christ come as a child, but he grew in stature with men and with God. And that he died on a cross, suffered for in our place for our sins. He rose again on the third day. He ascended to you. May we declare this, Father, that he will come again. That he is no longer a, a, a baby in a manger, but he is the king of heaven. He is the king of glory. And he will come to judge all of the living and all of the dead. We pray, Lord, that you may use this money that we give to proclaim this in this community, that your sheep, your lost sheep, may hear and may respond in return to you. 
For this is your promise that we heard this morning in the declaration of Mary and in her song that you remember. You remember your promises and you remember your faithfulness and you always, you always accomplish them. And we, we, we do your work, Father, in going to help you accomplish that purpose to call the lost and to spread the gospel in this community. We thank you again for everything that you've given us and pray that you would help us in our work. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. This time Alan's going to come up and do the big God for little hearts. Sunday in Advent, okay? Now we had, what was it? Hope, peace, and today was joy, okay? What brings you joy? What makes you happy? Okay, it's y'all's turn to talk. What's, do you like getting presents? Does that give you joy? I love presents. You do? Okay. <laughs> Of course, that's what we do on Christmas is we exchange presents, and that gives us a sense of joy. And joy is defined as a great pleasure or happiness. What would be the opposite of joy? Someone who's sad, okay? So we have joy, which is happiness, all right? Now, just a little bit of history about the Advent candles, okay? You notice that they're purple, except for the Christ candle, which is white, all right? And then we have this pink. And people say, why is there one that's pink? And they say that in the middle of the dark ages, the dark winters, uh, church thought about how people needed a little bit of a glimpse of what was coming. So what they did was they said, let's mix the white and the purple and we'll make pink. And that's the joy of what's to come. And what is that that is going to come? Sunday school answer? Jesus. There we go. So that's the Christ or Jesus is going to come. And what is the joy that Christ gives us? Okay. Anybody have an idea? You remember the, the song? Joy to the world, the Lord is come. Let earth prepare his king. Okay. So anyway. Now we know Christ is the joy in this world, okay? He provides that pure joy that can come from no other place but from Christ, okay? So let's say a quick little prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you for coming to this world and bringing us salvation and giving us joy in our hearts. In Jesus' name, amen. up there. <clears throat> Good morning. I'm grateful to be with you again. Uh, I'm Mike Rasmussen. I work with Hope Russia. We're a seminary and church planting partnership in Russia. And whether you know it or not, y'all y'all support us. So thank you. And actually, I'll be doing a seminar on the mission of the church in Siberia in February. Stalin used to send people to Siberia to freeze to death, but I'm being sent to Siberia to teach actually several Pentecostal uh, pastors and churches about the mission of the church. <clears throat> I'm also gonna ski with them a little bit while I'm there. And uh, I hope to be able to show them how the American boys do it, but I'm getting a little long in the tooth, so I think the jury's out on that. The passage of scripture on which our teaching is based this morning is the well-known Christmas passage in Luke chapter 2, starting in verse 8, read by Linus, who's right here on my Charlie Brown Christmas tie, <clears throat> in the Charlie Brown 
Christmas special. So starting in verse 8, very familiar. There were shepherds out in the field keeping watch over their flock by night, and an angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were filled with great fear. And the angel said to them, fear not, for behold, I bring you good news. And that's the Greek word gospel there. I bring you the gospel of great joy that will be for all the people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be a sign for you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly host praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace among those with whom he is pleased. When the angels went away from them to heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go over to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has made known to us. And they went with haste and found Mary and Joseph and the baby lying in a manger. And when they saw it, they made known the saying that had been told them concerning this child. And all who heard it wondered at what the shepherds told them. But Mary treasured up all these things, pondering them in her heart. And the shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all that they had heard and seen as it had been told them. And on that first Christmas Announcement Eve, when the angel appeared to the shepherds, it was dark. We know it for sure. There's no debate. All the scholars agree. Baptists and Presbyterians, Catholics, Anglicans, are all of one accord around this simple fact that on that first Christmas announcement Eve, it was quite dark. If you've ever gone camping on a moonless night, then you know how dark dark can be. And on this dark night, pupils dilated, accustomed to the dark, God's light crashed through. Verse 9, the glory of the Lord shone around them. A brilliant angel who would make the headlight on a freight train seem like a dim bulb. And here's where we're going this morning. Among the four gospel writers, Luke, most of all, likes to illustrate inward change in tangible ways. More than the other three, Luke uses tangible metaphors for intangible change on the inside, spiritual change. So only Luke, for example, gives us the prodigal son, where the son departs one direction and leaves his father and then does a 180-degree turn and physically goes back to the father, only Luke. Only Luke tells us about the ten lepers whom Jesus healed and that they walk away, but one of them chooses to physically turn 180 degrees back to say thank you. Only Luke tells us that if we put our hand to the plow and then turn and look back, that it's a problem. So uniquely, among the four Gospels, Dr. Luke, a very skillful writer, likes to illustrate life change in tangible terms. And it's to invite you to experience the same change. So that's exactly what's going on here in this famous text with the shepherd's shift from darkness to light. Luke is inviting you to shift too. If God had sent his angel at high noon, it wouldn't have had nearly the same effect. And thoughtful people have known for a long time that a bright light filling a dark space is exactly what God likes to do in our lives. God led the Israelites at night with a bright pillar of fire in their darkness. God filled the dark inner room of the temple with bright, blazing glory. In Genesis, at the beginning, God said, let there be light. And there was light. And later readers of Genesis knew that this first 
light explosion is also about Jesus Christ's light shining into your darkness and mine. Later readers like Paul the Apostle who wrote these words in 2 Corinthians chapter 4, for God who said, let light shine out of darkness has shown in our hearts to give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus. Later readers like John Milton in Paradise Lost, who's talking about Genesis 1, and then he prays this. He says, what is dark in me, illumine. So when you listen to the testimonies of new Christians telling their salvation story, they'll often bring up with no coaching, they'll tell of their experience as a light turning on. One young man named John told me, he said, my wife and I thought we were Christians all along. We were even members of a church, he said. But then we heard the gospel and it was, a light, it was like a light bulb turning on. So if you want to get the most from God's word this morning, you must wrap your brain around this one thing, that Luke's plan... Luke's plan is for you to experience the darkness to light thing that the shepherds had as the shepherds as your example. Even though you don't see the angel and you don't get to hold the baby. So we're going to see two ways that God changed the lighting in these shepherds' lives and then how it applies to your life. A child's Christmas play, children's Christmas play in Memphis, Tennessee, the program said, all the cast will be played by members of the eighth grade except the baby Jesus who will be played by a concealed 40-watt light bulb. <laughs> and ain't it the truth? John 8, 12, famous words, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will never walk in darkness but will have the light of life. There are many bright lights in the world. A man in Belgium has a collection of 60,000 cigarette lighters. And that's a lot of light, but Jesus is brighter still. The Yokohama Marine Tower lighthouse is higher than a football field, and every 20 seconds it emits a burst of 600,000 candle power. And that's a lot of light, but Jesus Christ is brighter still. He lights up the whole planet the light of the world. So the shepherd's life change from darkness to light showed up in two ways. Two ways that God changes the lighting in your life and mine. And the first one is an enlightened mind. God got their attention without doubt. The text doesn't tell us what the shepherds were thinking about before the angel. We only know that they had all night for their minds to wander wherever. What shepherding outfit shall I wear tomorrow? Perhaps the Harris Tweed. I sure hope it doesn't rain. I sure hope that cute shepherdess shows up tomorrow at the well in the afternoon. I sure hope Nick Saban doesn't torch George's defensive backfield again. <laughs> So odds are these guys weren't contemplating divine matters until God switched the lights on. And throughout the Bible, darkness to light symbolizes a tradition, a, a, a transition, pardon me, from not knowing or thinking much about God to thinking about him, a new focus, a switch from apathy, a darkened heart or mind, to enlightenment and attention. One Saturday I was watching a football game with a new Christian, a guy who was a new believer. He said, you know, it took a while. He said, my wife became a believer first, but then a few months later the light went on in my life. The bulb turned on. So lots of people with no coaching, coaching, no one putting words in their mouth, they describe this uh, inner change as, a, as God turning on a light bulb. 
And you know something? Your hand is on the switch too. These shepherds, your hand is on the switch too. They went from a lack of awareness about Jesus to a bright ray of fresh information about him, and they responded in faith. And Luke paints this picture in hopes that the same darkness to light decision will happen to you. In Paul's letter called Ephesians, an apathetic mind towards God, and it's possible for someone who's been a faithful Presbyterian since knee-high to a grasshopper to develop an apathetic mind towards God. In Paul's letter called Ephesians, an apathetic mind is darkness, and faith in Jesus is awakening to his light. Ephesians 4.18. They are darkened in their understanding and separated from the life of God because of the unawareness that is in them due to the hardening of their hearts. Ephesians 5.13. When anything is exposed by the light, it becomes visible. For anything that becomes visible is light. Therefore, it says, Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. So, in the testimony of John and Asi, these two men, God turned on the light. But, you know, their hands were on the switch, too. They and God turned on the light. Or more accurately, when God turned on the light, they didn't just pull the covers up over their head and roll over. Awake oh, sleeper. Wake up, sleeper. Don't just pull the covers over your head. Then Jesus, who died and rose for you, will shine on you. So if you say, I know enough about Jesus now, I don't need more of his light, this is, by definition, inner darkness. But if we say, Lord, help me, I'm stuck in a kind of darkness, please shine your light. Ephesians 5 says, this is a resurrection going on inside you. Awake, O sleeper, and arise from the dead and Christ will shine on you. Another children's Christmas play. Also, as expected, used an electric light bulb to show the radiance of the newborn Savior, and at one point, all the stage lights were to be turned off so that only the brightness of the manger could be seen. But the young rascal who controlled the lights got confused, and all the lights went out, including the manger. It was a tense moment, broke only when one of the nine-year-old shepherds said in a loud stage whisper, hey, you switched off Jesus. So it's okay to not care about quantum physics or string theory. It's okay to not care about how the internet works. It's okay to be like me, utterly ignorant of why people mail you a tiny piece of tissue paper in a wedding invitation. You know, what do they want me to roll my own? I haven't smoked since high school. So that's an unsolved mystery to me, and I really don't care. But it's not okay to be intellectually passive about Jesus. Yahweh clad in a diaper, but now, as Alan prayed, now resurrected and enthroned. So awake sleeper, for the first time or the hundredth time, awake sleeper and arise from the dead, and Christ will shine on you. Maybe today's the day for you. Your hand is on the switch too, you know, even for Presbyterians who believe in sovereignty. So the second way that God brought them from darkness to light is with brightened emotions. Joy is our theme today. Just like we don't know the shepherd's thoughts before they thought intensely about Jesus, just like that, we also don't know their emotions. Before they changed, first to a burst of utter terror, and then to grateful joy praising God. So we don't know their emotional starting point, but we do know their ending point. And just like we've got several starting points in the room this morning, We don't know if these shepherds were happy 
sad, bored, expectant, worried, disappointed, or just maybe tired. But we do know their circumstances a little. We do know they had to work the night shift, sitting there hunkered down in the dark watching their dumb, smelly sheep. We do know their housing situation because the Greek tells us that they were actually living outside. They didn't just happen to be outside. So camping is fun, but not for a month or two. We do know that everybody held low opinion, a low opinion of shepherds. They didn't get no respect. Their career path was not working out too well. In one ancient Jewish commentary on Psalm 23, the Lord is my shepherd, the writer goes way out of his way to bash shepherds. He says there is no more disreputable occupation than that of shepherd. Back in those times, it was illegal to buy wool or milk or lambs from a shepherd because the odds were super high that it was probably stolen. So what life events had left these men lurking at the bottom of the totem pole? We really don't know. So even though we don't know their feelings sitting there in the dark, we do, we can assume that these guys probably did not feel like they just won the lottery. And we must embrace Luke's imagery if we want the blessing, God's blessing from this scripture. We mustn't give short shrift to the Bible as literature. In the Psalms, sadness equals darkness. Psalm 42 says, why do I go about mourning? And the literal Hebrew there is, why do I walk in darkness? So are you mourning any loss these days? Any loss, large or small, walking in darkness? In Isaiah, worry equals darkness, gloom, anxiety. So are you burdened with anything these days, walking in darkness? Christmas intensifies it, you know, for many, because of expectations and because of memories. Christmas can intensify the darkness because of expectations. You just know, you just know that under the tree you're not going to find that Harley that you asked Santa for. That's what I asked him for sitting on his lap last week. <laughs> Santa, I want a Harley, fat boy with orange fenders. And I just know, burnt orange. I just know, and even though I hate Tennessee, <laughs> I just know it's not coming. It won't fit down the chimney. Or maybe you compare this Christmas with Christmas's past, happier times, maybe when the kids were young, or something. So Christmas, for some, it can crank up the darkness, strangely. 350 years ago, a doctor named Johannes Hofer, he coined the term, he invented the word nostalgia. And he listed, he noticed these symptoms of this thing called nostalgia in homesick Swiss mountaineers who had moved to the low country and they're pining away for the mountains of the past, produce strange symptoms in the present that the medical manuals of the day listed as depression, silence, vague feelings of unrest, sighing, and complete indifference to the present. Now I checked, we don't have too many Swiss mountaineers here this morning. You've all left your later hosen at home, but the season to be jolly can amplify the fact that you're not. So to wrap up, here's the big question to close for a few minutes. Luke illustrates inward change in outward ways. So how can you inwardly experience the shepherd's transition from darkness to light? What can you do 
because your hand is sort of on the switch as well. What can you do? What must you do to have the shepherd's enlightenment and a little shot of the shepherd's brightened emotions? They sort of have an advantage over us because all they had to do was make a logistical choice to physically travel and go and see and perhaps hold the baby, which always makes me happy. But we can't do that. They have the advantage because they were living at the start, the beginning of the gospel story, but you're living closer to the end of that same story. So what does the shepherd's decision to drop what they were doing and travel mean for you and for me? God, through this brilliant man, Dr. Luke, is telling us to make three choices to make the shepherd's journey your journey to experience the light of Jesus this Christmas and always. Three how-tos with which we close. And the first one is, like the shepherds, choose to devote blocks of time to Christmas contemplation. We don't know how many hours or even days it took the shepherds to get from wherever they were to Bethlehem where Jesus was. We don't know, but we do know they made a choice and a plan and they stuck with it. So believers have known for millennia since dirt that seeking God requires blocks of time of Bible reading, prayer, and contemplation. So wherever you are in life, this may mean, this may mean an early morning block of time. This may mean an early evening block of time after the kids have gone to bed. Your journey can be precisely like the shepherd's journey in that they surrendered a block of time to a new quest. So put down your smartphone and use a real Bible and devote some time. So you won't be tempted like me to surf to bedbathandbeyond.com all the time. <laughs> Go for a prayer walk. First read your Bible and then grab a cup of coffee and walk around your neighborhood praying and praising God. I do that because my mind wanders so much when I pray. So take a half day of fasting and prayer and scripture reading. So the first one is make a choice like the shepherds to devote blocks of time. And then the second one is we know from the Psalms that you don't need to brighten yourself up first to approach Jesus. It's the opposite. It's the opposite where we choose to talk to God up front about whatever darkness we're walking through. Psalm 42, it says, I say to God, my rock, why have you forsaken me? Why do I walk in darkness? Why are you cast down, O my soul? Why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. So we begin with our darkness. And that's because of God's gracious personality. We don't need to butter him up. Some of you may remember Bob Ross, who taught, he taught landscape painting on public television on Saturday afternoons way back in the day. And he was a Caucasian gentleman with an afro, like a Scottish dude with a Dr. J haircut. And Saturday afternoons, he'd do his painting thing, and if you had too much time on your hands, then you remember as well. And he'd say stuff like, he'd say, now, we're just going to add some nice little trees over here, some happy little trees. There they are. Aren't they happy? And anybody remember him? Did anybody watch him? Yeah, 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 you know, he's famous. Anyway, he would often say this. He would often say, in order to show light, you need dark. And the same is true spiritually because of God's gracious personality. The light of Christ relieves your darkness when you expose your darkness to him specifically. So something like this, Lord, I'm in darkness this way or that way. 
or this way and I need your light. So bring him your discouragement, your confusion, your addiction, your anger problem, your struggling marriage, your loneliness. So to understand the phrase, thy lamp, thy word is a lamp unto my feet. To even understand the phrase, thy word is a lamp unto my feet, you've got to handle the truth that you're presently walking in darkness. So choose to devote blocks of time, choose to bring your darkness, begin with it. And, and thirdly, is because the baby has grown up, this Christmas, choose to contemplate the whole gospel story, not only the baby in the manger. Luke says that unto you is born a savior, a savior. And this assumes the whole story of Christ crucified for you, risen for you, reigning today over planet Earth, and returning to finalize his kingdom here. So savior was a very big word back then. Victorious generals and kings called themselves savior. And they used the word good news or gospel to announce their arrival. So a savior back then is someone who snatches you from danger. A savior rescues you from condemnation. A savior cares for your safety and well-being. A savior restores order and justice to society without distorting the meaning of those words. A savior defends the case of someone who's been specifically wronged. So ponder the whole gospel story. Philippians 3.20, we await a savior from heaven, the Lord Jesus Christ, who will transform our lowly body to be like his glorious body by the power that enables him even to subject all things to himself. So this Christmas, may the shepherd's transition from darkness to light be yours. From wherever you are in your journey, may it be yours. Near the end of Luke, chapter 23, verse 44, Luke tells what happened while Jesus was dying, which many of you know. He says it was now about the sixth hour, which is noon, and there was darkness over the whole land until the ninth hour while the sun's light failed. So think about this, Luke, very clever writer. Luke begins with it becoming like day during the middle of the night in chapter 2. And he concludes with it becoming like night during the middle of the day. A coincidence? Hardly. On the cross, Jesus took all of your darkness, every form of it, all kinds of it. He freely brought it upon himself and put it to death and then rose so you will stand with him in the full light of day. So may you have a very merry and enlightened Christmas. Let us pray. Lord Jesus, may your light shine upon us. Man, woman, and child, young and old, may your light shine upon us in, in the most profound and needy, needed ways uh, this season. Amen. Seven. Angels we have heard on high. <clears throat> Let's all stand as we sing. Don't forget that tonight is our Christmas carol scene, so we'll see you here.
Faith Presbyterian Church family, may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.